Hey folks, Tim Newman with Softlight Studios and it's time for another video in our Mastering Photoshop series. Today's video is going to be our introduction into color management in Photoshop. Color management in Photoshop can be confusing when you first run into the myriad of choices and dialogue boxes that are offered to you, but in all reality, it's a fairly straightforward process with a really predictable outcome. Let's take a look at Photoshop. In this, our first video in what is undoubtedly going to be at least a three-part series on color management in Photoshop, we are going to begin by taking a look at the color settings dialog box, or at the very least, those features within the dialog box that we think are most likely to have an impact on our photo editing efforts within Photoshop. Now, it does not matter whether you are on a Macintosh-based system or a Windows-based system. The Color Settings dialog box is always found within the Edit menu very near the bottom, as you can see right here. And it's worth pointing out that on a Mac, it's a Shift-Command-K shortcut key sequence that brings up the Color Settings dialog box. Correspondingly, on a Windows system, that would be a Shift-Control-K shortcut key sequence for that same dialog box. I'm going to go ahead and click on this, and there is the Color our settings dialog box in person and ready for business. Now, before we jump into anything else in this dialog box, I want to point out this little settings drop down combo box right here and point out that we are in fact starting on the North America general purpose two color settings as our default color settings preset. Now, this isn't really all that important at the moment. This is the default for Photoshop installations here in the good old US of A, but before we wrap up with this first video, we are going to come back and visit this, and I just wanted to point out how it was set right now before we get started. Okay, there are two areas within this dialog box that matter to us for at least this installment of the series. The first is this working spaces panel right here that you can see bordered off by a kind of dark gray border here, and then below it, the color management policies area here that is also boarded off by a darker gray border. And it's interesting that these two are separated from one another here visually in the display because in practical operation, they are really inextricably linked. All right, let's start off with the working spaces section of the dialog box right here. And let's add a little interpretation to this. When Adobe says working spaces, what they in fact mean is that these are working color spaces that have been associated to these various image modes that you see over here. So our first image mode here is the RGB image mode, which stands for red, green, and blue, as you might well imagine. And this means that any document in this mode would have a red, green, and blue channel that is brought together to make the color that we see in that image. And that image mode currently is associated with this sRGB color space. And of course, there's some identifying numbers here in terms of uh, the IEC code and version. Not that that will ever really matter to you. And then down here for the CMYK image mode, that being cyan, magenta, yellow, noir, or black image mode, we have the US web coded swap V2 color space associated with that mode. Now this mode here is typically used by people that are doing pre-press document editing, getting ready to print their output on a multiple drum offset press printer that uses ink. In fact, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black ink on four drums to create images on sheets of paper that are pressed as those drums rotate around. Then of course you see the grayscale mode and the spot color mode and you also see that there are color spaces associated with those modes as well. Now, it's not likely that for the CMYK, grayscale, or spot image modes that you will be changing these color spaces unless, for example, if you are working on a pre-press document and your service bureau, i.e. print shop, says, hey, you need to use 
a different color space for your CMKY work, and they will tell you right here which one they expect you to use. But unless you're getting guidance on any of these latter three down here on changing the associated color space, it's probably best to leave these alone. Now, this first color space here associated with this RGB image mode is one that we do want to pay attention to. By default, out of the box, Adobe specifies the sRGB color space as the color space for this image mode. And if we click on the arrow in this drop-down combo box, we will open up all the color spaces that are available here for this image mode. And you can see there are a lot of them. And really the ones that we care about are the ones that are in this section right here that I'm highlighting. The ones below them, while there are a ton of them, are all pretty much associated with video editing color spaces. And these are various color spaces that are associated with certain types of video cameras or certain types of output that we would like to generate when we save this file. We won't very often use this. Not saying that some video editing folks won't, but it's probably not gonna be in the normal Photoshop user's bailiwick, if you will. So there are three color spaces that we really care about here in this dialog box. The sRGB one, which is already specified by default, the Adobe RGB one that you see up here, and then the Profoto RGB one that you see here in the middle. Those are the three that will get the bulk of our attention. Now the sRGB color space, the one that's specified here by default, is an older color space, and it's really associated with kind of the very first VGA monitors and some of the very first photographic printers. And as such, it's a very small color space. And when we say very small color space, what we mean to say is by the time that we get to richer shades of colors, we are typically outside of that device's ability to either display or, in the case of print, output those colors faithfully. And a color space's job is to look at those colors when they come by and say, oh, this shade of red is too bright. I can't display this or I can't print this. So let's re-render this shade as a shade that fits within this sRGB color space. And then correspondingly, any other shades of red that might have been bumping up next to that shade of red that was outside of the color space limitations gets re-rendered in a relative way as well so that there is still a good even tonal shift between all those colors that were adjacent to one another and that all of them are still within that color space. So sRGB, again, is an older, smaller color space. It's really safe for web output because you really never know what age of computer is going to be displaying your JPEG file via the internet. So this means that all documents will be safe as they're rendered in this smaller color space and they end up being displayed on much older computers than you intended. Now, the Adobe RGB 1998 color space is a newer color space than sRGB and as such, it has the capability of allowing a wider range of colors to be displayed and or a wider range of colors to be printed. So typically, if you are saving your work for print, you really want to use this larger Adobe RGB color space because most printers nowadays support this Adobe RGB 1998 color space. And then you get printed output with a wider range of colors available on it. As an aside here, one of the things that I keep an eye on, if I am about to send off, say, a TIFF file for output by a service bureau, if that service bureau says to me, oh, we don't accept Adobe RGB 1998 color spaced files, they're not printing my work because they're printing with an older color space that's liable to not give me the color intensity and tonality that I expect. Now there's one more color space that we said was important that we wanted to pay attention to, and that's the Pro Photo RGB color space that you see me highlighting here. That color space is an extremely large color space supporting a tremendous range of tonality in all the colors in the color space and therefore gives us about the widest range of colors that we can expect. Now, there's a little bit of a theological argument about the Pro Photo RGB color space. There are a lot of people that say, well, it can't be printed by any output device, and there are no display devices yet that display all the colors in the range, so why use it? 
But my philosophy is, and this is where the rubber meets the road for me, Lightroom uses a derivative of the Profoto RGB color space for every preview file that it creates. It, of course, it respects the color space associated with the files coming in, but preview files are rendered in the Profoto RGB color space. And when you send an image from Lightroom as a round trip edit over to Photoshop and then back to Lightroom, it will come back in whatever color space you specify. And being that we're already sending it over in Profoto RGB, I go ahead and work in Profoto RGB in Photoshop. And then that corresponding TIFF or PSD file that I get back from Photoshop into the Lightroom catalog stays in that Profoto RGB color space. And the beauty of this is in Lightroom, I can always downsample at export time to any color space I want. So at export time, if I'm going to create a JPEG for the web, it's going to be sRGB. If I'm going to create a TIFF file that's going to go to a printer, it's going to be Adobe RGB 1998. And let's say that I'm going to create a Photoshop file to send off to someone else to help me with my backlog of editing. Well, they're going to get that as a Profoto RGB file. So I always work my way up to the largest color space in my workflow and only downsample at export time when need be. So we are going to select Profoto RGB as our color space here that is the working color space for any documents that are in the RGB image mode mode. Say that three times really, really fast. Okay, so now that that's set, we want to take a look down here at color management policies. And you might remember a little while ago, I said these are inextricably linked to our working spaces that are selected above. And here's how. For the RGB image mode, I can say that any document that comes in that does not match my working color space, i.e. that Profoto RGB that's specified up above, I would like to turn the color management policy off. I don't really care what happens here. I can just specify whatever I want when I'm working on that document. Or I would like to preserve the embedded profile, which means if the document comes in as a Adobe RGB 1998 color space embedded in that document, leave it alone, or convert to my working RGB color space, which again is that Profoto RGB color space that I've associated with the RGB image mode documents up here. So I tend to flip all of these over to convert to the working color space for each of the corresponding image modes that I see here. Now that might be all well and good, but there's one wrinkle that gets thrown in here that you have to pay attention to because it changes the way Photoshop presents mismatches or missing color spaces to you. And that is these three checkboxes right here. So for these first row of checkboxes right here for profile mismatches, if I open up a document that is not in the color space of my working color space for that image mode type, then I am going to have Photoshop ask me when opening that document what to do. And I, now by default, it's going to want to convert it to the working RGB color space, but it's going to ask me, would you like to convert to the working color space, use the embedded color space, or don't manage color at all? So by turning this dialog box on, not only is that the default choice there, but I get asked to confirm it, which is always nice to know because I'd like to know when documents are coming in and there are issues with the color profiles that are associated with them. And the same thing here, same choice. This is for a profile mismatch. This might be me pasting in an image from another tab within Photoshop, or it could be as easy as me seeing an image in a Microsoft Word document, copying that image into the paste buffer, and then pasting it into an open Photoshop document. If that color profile of that pasted document doesn't match, I'm going to get that same dialog box saying, what would you like me to do here with this as my default selected if I simply hit OK. Now, last but not least, if a document that I bring in has a missing profile, i.e. no color space or profile associated with it at all, I'm going to get the same dialog box, but it's going to say, hey, this document doesn't have a color profile associated with it at all. What would you like me to do? So there you go. There's those 
two panels within the color settings dialog box. Now, you remember I said I wanted us to pay attention to the settings combo box right here? You notice that it switched from North American General Purpose 2 to custom, meaning we changed away from the default settings that are factory installed with Photoshop. And if you do that, what I would recommend you do is save that as a color setting preset. I'm going to say this is TDN color settings. And when I go to save that, it's going to say, would you like to put a, some notes on there? And I'm going to say TDN color setting. Oops, got to type correctly first. Preferences. I cannot <laughs> type today. And I'm going to say this is from 7-14-2019. So I have a little reference there. And I'm going to go ahead and click on OK there. And you can see that's now my color settings preset for this with my little description there that I put there. I'm going to click on OK. And those color settings are now my color settings of choice in Photoshop. All right. Don't forget to subscribe here because we're going to come back with a part two of this video and talk about color settings mismatches how to identify a color setting that is currently associated with a document, and how to quickly change a color setting that is associated with a document. All right, hang out here for just a second. We'll wrap up with a few comments, and then we'll have you out of here. Well, that's it, folks. There you go, an introduction to the color settings dialog box in Photoshop, and a little bit of a background on some of those messages you get when you open up documents that don't have the color space that you would expect to be associated with them. I hope that clears that up for you. It makes it a little easier to understand what Photoshop is thinking when that happens. Stay tuned. There are at least three more parts to this series, which of course you can keep track of by hitting that subscribe button down below. Well, we appreciate you tuning in. Hope this is bringing some valuable information your way. And remember, as we always say, learning equals skills, practice equals mastery. We'll see you out there.